Okay. Let's get started. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay, it's good, right? Okay, let's pick up where, uh, pick up, uh, where we left off. Remember, we were discussing whether or not to cover this in the last 10 minutes yesterday, and we decided not to. But to jog your memory, this is what we covered last. We were talking about memory interference and quality of service, and we're going to talk a lot about that today. At least the morning will be spent on different ways of doing memory scheduling and handling interference in the memory system. So this, uh, as I mentioned, is, if you remember this, uh, it's one of the first, al it's the first algorithm for pair multi-core memory scheduling that's targeted for DRAM. And it actually has a lot of benefits if you read the paper. The downside, it's relatively complex to implement. It doesn't handle all types of interference, as I'm going to show you. And slowdown estimations can be incorrect. And as I said, we were going to get back to that with stall time fair memory scheduling. Now let's move to something else. Uh, this is one of the next things that we did, actually, when we, were, uh, on, when we were trying to understand the interference that's happening in the main memory system between different applications. And I like this work a lot, as I mentioned. This is the third paper that I assigned uh, uh, because it's actually showing something, uh, show, showing that some of the techniques that you use to tolerate the latency of DRAM uh, can completely become, I won't, I'm not going to say useless, but less effective or ineffective if your memory controller is doing something exactly opposite of what the processor is doing. So I think this is a case for coordinating uh, at some level what the core, what the processor is doing and what the memory controller is doing. So what's the problem? Basically, processors today try to tolerate the long DRAM access latency by generating multiple upstanding requests. We mentioned that, memory, it's called memory level parallelism. And you do this by performing out of order execution. You can actually, whenever there's a miss outstanding, there's a, there could be other misses that are outstanding uh, from independent instructions. And you use non-blocking caches to enable this. And you use things like run ahead execution, which is part of my PhD thesis. And you, you may also use multi-threading, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. Basically, you put a lot of infrastructure to actually, whenever you get a long latency cache miss, you overlap that latency with other cache misses such that the cost of the cache miss is amortized. Right? That's the idea of memory level parallelism. You stall only once for many cache misses, approximately, as opposed to once for a single cache miss. But these techniques are effective only if the DRAM controller actually services those multiple requests in parallel in different DRAM banks. First of all, those cache misses should go to different DRAM banks at the same time. Otherwise, they're, they're by definition serialized to begin with. So you don't really exploit bank level parallelism. This is why mapping is extremely important. That bank address randomization is extremely important. Yeah, currently there's no pipeline. No pipeline go. Yeah, the sub area level parallelism paper that I mentioned uh, and that the Intel folks said that it was in DDR4E proposed standard, actually proposes pipelining within a bank, basically. You get rid of a lot of the downside of the bank conflicts within a bank. So if you have subarray level parallelism, you improve actually your bank level parallelism even better. But if your memory control is not doing the right thing, then you could actually get rid of a lot of the benefits as I will show you uh, in, a, in a little bit. So assume that these requests are serviced in parallel in the DRAM banks somehow. Uh, if you look at the memory controller, we've discussed that multiple threads in multi-core systems share the memory controller, and DRAM controllers are not aware of any thread. As a result, they're not aware of each thread's memory level parallelism, which means that they can easily service each thread's outstanding request serially and not in parallel. So let me give you an example of this. this I'll, I'll, I'll use a pictorial example. Let's assume we have a single thread, single hardware context, it's executing, it does some computation, and it executes two load instructions that miss in the caches, and that ge generates two DRAM requests. And in order to proceed, both of these requests need to come back so that you continue with the data. So these requests go to uh, these two memory banks. Let's assume they go to two different banks, and memory controller services them in a pipeline manner. One goes to the first bank, the other one goes to the next bank, and then while, the bo while both of these requests are being serviced, their bank access latencies are overlapped, as you can see. And the thread stalls waiting for both of the data. After some point, Bank Zero finishes servicing the first request, but the thread still waits because it needs the second piece of data from the other bank. And then the second piece of data comes back and the thread can continue computation. Now what happened here is because of this memory level parallelism that got serviced in different banks in parallel at the same time, 
bank access latencies of the two requests are overlapped, and the thread, as a result, stalls for approximately one bank access latency. There are parts that you cannot parallelize, like the bus latency, command latency, dot, dot, dot. I'm just ignoring them. You can, you can say that those are the little parts over here. Bank access latency is a longer part. Okay, now let's see what happens if you have two of these threads running together. And they're both computing, and at some point, they both generate two DRAM requests each, and they send these requests to the memory controller, and memory controller receives them in this order. Let's assume that the memory controller services the requests in first come, first serve order. It, it first takes thread A's request to bank zero, schedules it. It then takes thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. And while these requests are going on, these requests are waiting, and the threads are stalling, waiting for requests to come back. Now, after some point, this request gets serviced. The memory controller takes the next request to bank zero, which is thread B's request to bank zero, and starts servicing it. And after some point, this one finishes. Uh, and mem the memory controller takes the next request to bank one and schedules it to bank one. And while these two requests are being serviced, both of the threads are still stalling because they're waiting for these requests to come back because they need both of the requests that they sent uh, to continue. And after some point, the request that was over here, thread B's request to bank zero, gets done. Now thread B can continue its computation. Thread A waits until its request gets done. And when its request gets done, both threads can continue computation. Now what happened here is because the memory controller re serviced the request in a particular way, both threads stalled for approximately two bank access latencies because their request bank access latencies were serialized. So you did not service them in parallel as we've seen before. So the key question is, is this the right thing to do as if, if you were the memory controller? Meaning, can you do better than this? And the idea of the parallelism aware scheduler is basically yes, you can do better by realizing that you could actually overlap these requests in each thread, and maybe you should actually do that so that each thread stalls less. So let's take a look at a, what a parallelism aware scheduler would do. Basically, the same threads, they generate requests, two requests each. They both arrive at the memory controller in the same order again. Now the memory controller is a little bit more intelligent. It's able to realize that requests are coming from different threads, and it also says, I would like to try to service each thread's request as, as much in parallel as possible in the different banks. So let's say it first takes thread A's request to bank zero and schedules it. And then, as opposed to taking some other thread's request to bank one and scheduling it, it looks into the queue and asks the question, is there thread A's request to bank one? And it finds that request down here and schedules thread A's request to bank one so that thread A's requests are uh, serviced in parallel in different banks. And while this is going on, both threads stall. The latencies of thread A's requests are being overlapped at this point. And at some point later, uh, thread A's request to bank zero is done. Th uh, the memory controller takes the next request to bank zero and schedules it. At some point, uh, thread A's request to bank one is done. And the memory controller takes thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. At this point, thread A can continue because both of its requests are done. And thread A can continue computation. But thread B now stalls because its requests are being serviced in parallel in the banks. And after some point, thread B's requests are done, which means that thread B can continue computation. Now what we've achieved essentially is we've shifted how we service the requests, but we've saved a lot of cycles because we've completed thread A's request much earlier than we would have otherwise done if we serialized both threads' requests. Thread B didn't gain, but it didn't lose also in this case. As a result, the average stall time of the entire system reduces. It's about one and a half bank access latencies over here if you do this counting, whereas it was two, two bank access latencies over here. So that's the idea. Then the key question is how, actually how you build it. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yes? That's true, yes. You, Exactly, yeah, exactly. This is just a motivating example, but if you look at over time, you, could, you would also benefit from here. It depends on the heterogeneity in the requests. And actually, if you have more threads, you could benefit even more. I'll give you another uh, motivating example with more threads. Okay, so that's the idea. Now the question is how do you actually enable something like this? Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, I, I find this fascinating because there's a lot of work that uh, led to uh, enabling memory level parallelism. If your memory controller is doing the wrong thing, whatever your processor is doing may not matter, right? <laughs> Yeah. Because they everything in order at once. 
Well, it doesn't matter actually. Basically, the memory controller is not aware of threads. It could easily do this. It may also do this, depending on the arrival order of the threads, but it's not explicitly doing this, basically. So it's, the memory controller is not doing the worst case. <laughs> it's basically just doing some scheduling that's really not aware of what's happening, uh, this parallelism. And we want to make it aware to do better. Yes? So yes, this is, this is assuming that there are some requests that are queued up in the memory controller, right? If, but that's the case if you, if, if you have multiple requests outstanding, hopefully. So if, 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 if your memory controller is not loaded enough, then uh, you don't have a big problem, perhaps. But you could also run into bad cases where a request comes and you serialize it after you start the request, of course, right? Okay. So basically, there are two principles for parallelism over batch scheduling. One is parallelism awareness, which is I kind of implicitly gave this principle. Basically, the idea is to schedule requests from a thread to different banks back to back. If you've decided scheduling one thread, keep scheduling that other thread's request to other banks. This preserves each thread's bank parallelism. Now, the problem is if you do this greedily, this can cause starvation because you, can have, you, you, you basically are taking requests from one thread and keeping on scheduling that thread's request, and the thread may be generating more requests <coughs> while you're scheduling. As a result, you, could, you might be quickly servicing this thread and only that thread for a long time. So to uh, eliminate this, we use another principle that's well known actually in disk systems, and the idea is batching over here. And you do this within a batch. What is a batch? Batch means you group a fixed number of oldest requests from each thread into what's called a batch and you service the batch before all other requests, and you form a new batch when the current one is done. Now this ensures that you don't have any starvation. This is starvation free, and it provides some sort of fairness. We're gonna get back to fairness. And it also allows parallelism awareness within a batch. So within a batch, you can be extremely unfair, potentially, and parallelism aware, but across the batch, you ensure that starvation doesn't happen. So batching is, I think, used in uh, I.O. systems, for example, disk systems, to ensure there is no starvation. And we're, we're basically adopting that batching idea in this case. So let me give you pictorially another example. We have two banks. Let's say we have four threads. And it's a cooked up example as usual, but it, it illustrates the idea. Basically what we do is we form a batch based on the requests that are in the request buffer. I'm going to talk about the details in a little bit. And then we start scheduling requests in a parallelism aware manner. We first take thread zero's request to the different banks and schedule them. And while that's happening, other requests arrive but they don't get included in the batch because you formed the batch. You want to ensure that you're starvation free. And then you take thread one's request and schedule them in parallel, back to back in the banks. And then you then take uh, thread two's request, schedule them back to back. And as you can see, thread two's requests that are outside the batch don't get scheduled. And then you take thread three's request and schedule them back to back. And once the batch is done, you move and form another batch. So that's the idea. Okay. So basically this has two components, batching of the requests and within batch scheduling. Let's talk about the, both of them. Actually, the paper evaluates both of them separately also. You could do batching without parallelism awareness and you could do parallelism awareness without batching. Neither of them is perfect. And you could use batching with other, uh, uh, within batch scheduling methods also. I think batching is a very good principle for starvation freedom. It's much better than very hard. Uh, so some of the memory controllers uh, that are out there say, if a request has been outstanding for let's say 10,000 cycles, make sure you schedule it. And after that point, the memory controller goes into this really weird mode in general, uh, sometimes, uh, where you're doing basically first come, first term scheduling, whatever is, has been outstanding for a long time. But I think batching is a much nicer way of uh, guaranteeing starvation freedom. Okay, so let's talk about how you do batching. Batching is actually very simple to do. Uh, essentially, you associate each memory request with a single bit. Uh, let's call it the marked bit. Marked means it's, for, it's part of the batch. It's part of the oldest batch. Uh, to form a batch, in this paper, we followed an algorithm where you mark up to some number of marking cap number of oldest requests per bank for each thread. And all of the marked requests constitute the batch. And you form a new batch when no marked requests are left. That's the idea. And marked requests are always prioritized over unmarked ones. So it's a priority order. Uh, there is no reordering of requests across batches. As a result, there is no starvation and high fairness, although we get, we'll get back to high fairness because fairness is also affected by what you do within the batch. Uh, then the key question is how do you prioritize requests within a batch? 
OK. So basically, within the batch, you can use any existing DRAM scheduling policy. You can use FRFCFS, and the paper evaluates that, if you look at the paper. Uh, it exploits robot for locality. This is good. But we don't want to only exploit robot for locality. We want to also preserve intra-thread bank parallelism, as we said. And uh, unfortunately, these two are at odds with each other, and the paper covers that uh, a little bit. Locality and parallelism are sometimes at odds with each other. Uh, to be able to preserve intra-thread bank parallelism, you need to service each thread's request back to back, as we discussed. So how do we do that? Basically, uh, the paper introduces the idea of ranking the threads. You, uh, you compute a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. And higher ranked threads are prioritized over lower rank, ranked ones. And uh, if you do this, what you're doing is you're really improving the likelihood that threads from a, uh, requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks. Because all of the banks are obeying the same rank order. As a result, all of them are trying to prioritize the same thread at a given time. I think I, I've said that. And you could actually extend this ranking to uh, multiple memory controllers also. Uh, that This paper doesn't cover that, but we have some other work that talks about that uh, later on. That makes it a little bit more complicated, of course, if you want to extend to the multiple memory controllers. OK, so the key question is now, now that we've ranked, ranking enables uh, a thread's request to go back to back uh, in different banks. But how do you do this ranking? Now, there should be a ranking algorithm as well. Uh, so let me give you an example over here uh, as to how ranking helps. So this is a very similar example to what I've shown you, bank zero, bank one, uh, thread, uh, the red threads request and then blue threads request. This may be this original scheduling order, which basically destroys both threads parallelism. Now, this is the memory service timeline, if you uh, pictorially see this. Basically, both threads wait for two bank access latencies. This is essentially what I showed you earlier. So a key idea is ranking. Let's assume you rank thread A over thread B. I didn't tell you exactly how we do the ranking. We actually, the paper actually explores a bunch of ran ranking algorithms, including a random randomized ranking algorithm. Uh, if you do the ranking, basically what you're saying is thread A is ranked higher than thread B, so all banks should uh, obey, obey that rank order. If, if all banks obey that rank order, this is how they will schedule the requests, and thread A's uh, waiting time reduces, thread B's waiting, waiting time doesn't increase in this particular case. So you save cycles. But how do you do the ranking affect system throughput and fairness? Uh, ideally, we would like to maximize system throughput and we would like to minimize unfairness at the same time. And when we were developing this, our fairness definition was equalizing the slowdown of uh, equal priority threats, still the same as stall time fair memory scheduling. And it turns out, uh, if you want to maximize system throughput, what does this mean? You would like to minimize this average stall time of threads within the batch. Remember the stall time, how much you're waiting uh, uh, for memory. You would like to minimize the average of that because that correlates with system throughput. If you want to minimize unfairness, you really would like service threads that inherently have low stall time early in the batch. And the insight is that the threads that have inherently low stall time are threads that are not very memory intensive. Right? If you delay them, it results in high slowdown for them. If your goal is to equalize the slowdown, you don't want to delay the threads that have very little delay to begin with. Because let, let's think about it this way. If you have, uh, I like thinking about this as we're going to get back to the elephant and mice. But you have a mice thread, uh, or mouse in this case, and an elephant thread. Uh, let's assume that uh, mm, this is stall time. Inherent stall time when it's running alone is 1. Inherent stall time of this is 100. I just made it up. If you delay this one by an additional one, its slowdown is basically 2x, right? If you delay this one by another additional one over here, its slowdown is by basically 101 over 100, right? That's the insight. If you delay this one, it doesn't matter. It's an elephant. It's slow anyway. If you delay this one, you slow it down a lot because it's a mouse. Right? So that's the insight over here. You would like to minimize unfairness. And it turns out these two things turn out to be uh, similar to each other. I'm not going to claim that they're exactly the same. But uh, if you do shortest stall time first ranking, Within, uh, within the batch, you get close to achieving both of them. Now, there's a lot of theory behind shortest job first. This is essentially shortest job first. Uh, and if you have a single server, as we discussed yesterday a little bit, if you have a single server queue with no row buffer, no bank level parallelism, this is optimal for system throughput. Clearly, we don't have that case over here. But shortest stall time first, what it's trying to do is it's trying to rank these threads earlier than these threads within the batch. 
as a result, it's trying to minimize the average stall times. It's also trying to minimize uh, unfairness. So what we're going to try to do is to approximate this. Now, that's not easy to do because you, keep, you, you get uh, requests into the batch. You need to compute what your stall time, uh, uh, what your original stall time is. So we'd like to estimate each thread's original stall time within the batch, and we'd like to rank the threads with shorter stall time higher. Yes? Yeah, so we're going to take a look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you an example. Hopefully that will be clear. We're going to try to estimate shortest stall time based on the max bank load, like what is the maximum load to your bank. Okay, so the next question is, assuming now uh, you buy all of this, which hopefully you do. <laughs> if not, you're going to read the paper anyway. Uh, but basically, how do you estimate the, it boils down to how do you estimate the shortest stall time? So we're going to, the, the key metric is this, uh, what I just mentioned the maximum number of marked requests to any bank. Assuming your requests are serviced in parallel, this is what dictates your stall time. The maximum number of requests you have to any bank within a batch. We're not considering across batches. Now this of course breaks down once you look at across batches, but there's a good reason why we don't want to look across batches. And if you want to improve this algorithm, you should really think about how to do the batching for sure. Uh, so basically, we would like to rank the thread with lower max bank load higher because a thread that has lower maximum bank load inherently should have low stall time. Now, if, there, if two threads have the same maximum number of requests to any bank, you need to break the tie. So if you look at actually overall intensity of the thread within the batch, this is called total load. It's the total number of marked requests to any bank. And you we rank the thread with lower total load higher. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Yes. Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, so this is a heuristic that does not take into account that, and we find that actually it works reasonably. But if you really want to be exact, you need to look at those also. I'm going to give you an example without uh, 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 considering the row buffer, but the paper is a more sophisticated example considering the row buffer itself. So yeah, so the, uh, the answer is yes, it does matter, but we kind of ignore it because we're going to take that into account in the scheduling algorithm also. Otherwise, it becomes very complex actually. <laughs> Okay, so let me give you this example. Let's assume that we ignore the row buffer. The same example is actually uh, in the paper with the row buffer, with some row buffer uh, assumptions. So it's, uh, it's an approximate thing. It doesn't give you the exact stall times, but it's, it's trying to get, the, get a good balance between complexity and uh, uh, the performance that you would buy. So this is, assume that these are the requests that are to different banks. Uh, let's compute these values for the different threads. So let's first take thread zero. Thread zero has three requests, and its max bank load, meaning the maximum number of requests to any bank, is one, right? It has at most one request to any bank, so this is one. Its total load is three, because it has three requests. Let's take a look at thread two, oh, th thread one. Thread one's max bank load is two. Its maximum number of requests to any bank is two to bank zero over here. Its total load is four. Now it's easy. Now thread two's max bank load is also two, it has two requests each to bank one and bank two, and its total load is six. Thread three's max bank load is huge. Basically, it's five over here, and its total load is nine. That's the idea. So if you would like to include... One batch? Yeah, this is one batch, basically. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking across the batches uh, at this point. So you could actually, for example, include uh, the row buffer over here, but it makes the calculation a little bit harder, as you can imagine, right? Because now you need to figure out... And also, the algorithm may... Not may violate some of that. That's okay. We can have that discussion. Yeah, T one. Okay, let's go to T one. Yeah, yeah, but this is this is this is how the requests arrive. Yeah, we're not doing mapping here. Yes. <laughs> Of course, yeah, of course, if, you're max if, if you have mapped your data much nicer, you could get a better schedule, but at this point, you have no control, right, in the memory scheduler. <laughs> so that also shows the importance of mapping, yeah, if you actually distribute your request better, you would get a better schedule for sure, yes. But this is what the memory controller needs to deal with. Somebody already mapped the data, how do you deal with it? <laughs> okay, so now we've calculated this, meaning that th ranking, conveniently in this case, is thread zero is ranked higher than thread one, 
is ranked higher than thread two because of this uh, tiebreaker, and that's ranked higher than thread three. Now let's take a look at what this buys us. This is our baseline scheduling order. Remember, we're ignoring the row buffer. Uh, as a result, FCFS, first come, first serve, is the arri uh, your arri arrival order is the same as your baseline scheduling order. Let's take a look at how long it takes to finish each thread. What is the stall time within the batch of each thread? And I'm going to look at it based on bank access latencies over here. So that's the time, service order, service time. Thread zero, last request of thread zero is serviced after four time units. So it stalls for four time units. Thread one, its last request is serviced also after four time units. So it stalls for four time units. Thread two, its last request is serviced after five time units. So it stalls for five. And thread three, its last request is serviced after seven time units. So it stalls for seven. Yeah, this is basically first, and first, first come, first serve. Uh, the paper is a detailed example with the row buffer. So we, we actually have some row buffer hits and row buffer conflicts in the paper. So it's, you get to a similar point uh, with row buffers. But it, it complicates the example for sure. So the average, if you take the average, you get five bank access latencies over here. Now let's take a look at what would parallelism aware scheduler do within this batch. Remember the scheduling order is going to be based on this ranking, not the arrival order. We already have these requests, now we're ranking them. Thread zero is ranked over anything else. So its requests are serviced in parallel in three banks over here. As a result, its stall time is one time unit because its last request is serviced after one time unit. Thread one is ranked second, so its last request is serviced after two time units. You can see that we're preserving parallelism as much as possible, especially starting with these low intensity threads to begin with. Thread two's requests are serviced in the next rank order. As a result, its last request is serviced after four time units. So you get four as a stall time. And thread three, you don't do much over here. Its last request is serviced after seven time units. So you get seven. Now this is a nice example that doesn't delay any of the threads, but you could actually delay some of the threads if you have a row buffer uh, locality. But we're not going to talk about that. Uh, you, could look, you can read the paper for the example. So what did we buy? Basically, the average stall time as you can see over here is about three and a half bank, uh, is, is three and a half bank access latencies, which means that you reduce the average stall time by about 30% in, within this batch. And that's the idea. That's where the benefits, part of the benefit is coming from. Now, you were not reducing the overall stall time because there's, st there's stuff outside the batch over here, uh, and that makes the example much more complex, obviously. But if this, is only, if this is the only stuff that you have, if you don't have anything outside the batch, this directly reduces the stall times of the threads. Okay, so now that we uh, motivated it, and that's the algorithm, uh, what is the scheduling algorithm itself? So clearly rank order is one, but we've actually looked at many different algorithms. You could, so it's a prioritization order, basically. Yeah, exactly, it'll start after, the, uh, basically it'll start after whenever the requests are serviced. So the last, next batch will start over here, basically. Yeah, of course. Of course, yes, I, that's what I'm going to talk about here. It's a prioritization order. It's not, you don't waste bandwidth, otherwise it's terrible. Yeah, that's what I Yeah, yeah, you never waste bandwidth. <laughs> you could waste bandwidth if you were a very intelligent predictor in, into the future, but we're not doing that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a prioritization yeah. order. So how do you take into, how do you take into the, the consideration that we now have slots in several banks in the, for the next batch? If you, if you, you assume that you start from zero in a way, uh -huh. you may have a thread that has more requests, uh -huh. but let's use the banks that are in each the middle band as opposed to in each uh, to this uh, is stuck with the, uh, yeah, can you go back? Uh, this one, okay. Basically, there may be stuff that's not marked here. They, they get serviced. Uh, uh, yeah, basically, once, once the marked stuff is done, they get serviced. And then they become marked after some point. Yes, you could optimize that part also. And, and we've looked at how to optimize it, but it doesn't buy you that much according to what you've looked at. <laughs> okay.
Yes, but that's true in the baseline also. So that's the, that's the, diff that's the thing, right? It, it doesn't, you know, you're not changing anything compared to the baseline. So I, I agree that batching limits you, but there's a reason for it. Because if you, if you don't batch, uh, these elephant threads will dominate everything. Sure. That's the, so that's the big problem, right? You don't want the elephant threads to be dominating. <laughs> So we're going to talk about that. I, I think, I think uh, okay, let me, let me con continue. Uh, because I think you're now simulating the algorithm in your head. Yes, uh, that's why this is a difficult problem. It's not easy. <laughs> okay, well, let me continue, and then maybe some of these will uh, get answered. Because if you look at the paper, actually, the paper actually exactly tries to deal with some of these things. But it's not that it's easy to deal with. Uh, you may, for example, decide to mark requests after you realize that, oh, the, the batch is too short or something like that, but it's very hard to do that. That's why it's good to have a batch. But there, there could be better algorithms, no question about that. So what's the scheduling policy? Let's talk about that first. Basically, we want to prioritize the batch over the other because we want starvation freedom. We want something where we could actually uh, ensure starvation freedom and some fairness. Now, this is, the, this is another interesting part. Like, what, what do you use, actually, as the second priority? Do you, do you use higher rank thread first, or do you use row row hit request first. Now we've looked at uh, different combinations of this, and it turns out this combination performs slightly better, meaning that you prioritize row hit requests over higher rank. But this, uh, if you actually swip, uh, swap these higher rank versus uh, prioritize over row hit requests, that also performs okay. The intuitive thing, thing, thing for me is actually the third one, uh, the ba basically what I just said. You prioritize higher rank threads first, and then within each thread you prioritize row hit first. That's the intuitive thing, but that turns out, on average, it doesn't, uh, it's slightly worse than this prioritization order. Because there are th things that we cannot easily account for, right? There, there's so much going on in the memory controller that uh, ranking is not always perfect. Right? Things are not as nice as just the sh uh, uh, what I just showed you over here. The mapping is slightly, it's like slightly window, or yes. better to Yes. <laughs> so in... in so basically, in, in, in the algorithm that, we, that I described, you basically form a new batch after all the previous mark requests are done. The number of mark requests goes to zero, and then you start marking again. But I mean, we've looked at also, oh, what if you have continuous marking? Let's say you marked, and then you all already have some requests over here. You mark some of them again. So you have, right now, we basically have a single oldest batch, and everything else is not batched. But you could also say, oldest batch, second oldest batch, third oldest batch, and everything else is not marked. And we've looked at all those schemes also. So you could actually look at many, many variants of this. Like and increasing the size of the batch. Uh, well, if you have a second batch, you're not increasing. It's a priority order across the batches also, right? This is basically one bit saying marked batch or not, not batch. You could have batch one, batch two, batch three, and not batched. That's right. You, you mark each, each request, then you wait until they are all consumed, and then you mark Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the current algorithm. That's, because everything else actually may buy you something, but it adds complexity, plus uh, how much it buys you is not. OK, I think we can take some of these discussions offline. We're getting into the guts of the scheduling algorithm, and there's a lot in scheduling. It's not. Uh, okay, so there are three properties of this. Basically, it exploits robo for locality and also intra-thread bank parallelism. As I said, these are at odds with each other. There's no perfect way of combining it as, as far as what we found uh, so far. It's work conserving, meaning that you don't waste bandwidth. You, so you service unmarked requests to banks without marked requests. And marking cap is clearly important. That's what's been bothering people here. Marking cap is definitely a very important parameter. And if you have a too small cap, you destroy robo for locality. If you have too large of a cap, now you penalize the mice because the elephants start dominating the batch. Right. 
And if you're doing ranking, you don't want elephants to dominate the batch. You need to have some other re resolution mechanism. So it won't be as nice anymore. OK, so there are many more trade-offs analyzed in the paper. <laughs> What do you mean? Different threads have different thread are just happen to hit their share data or something. Really. Yeah, it depends on if if they share data, right? In these workloads, we're looking at multi-program workloads where there is no sharing. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the yeah in these workloads that we evaluate, we, there is no none. But that could happen also. Okay, so you can read the paper for uh, the hardware cost. Basically, uh, there are no complex operations. Stall time frame memory scheduling actually had complex operations, and uh, yeah. So okay, what are the results? Uh, I promised you I will show you STFM results also yesterday. This is unfairness, let's start with unfairness, which is the maximum slowdown of any thread divided by minimum slowdown of any thread. Uh, and this is first ready, first come, first serve. As, as you can see, it's very unfair. So lower is better in this case. One is the ideal in this case. If you do first come, first serve, you actually uh, improve uh, unfairness, make things ma fair. And this is the network fair queuing schedule. Basically, you apply the fair queuing principle that are used in routers, uh, one version of it, to the memory controller. But because it doesn't take into account bank level parallelism and robot for locality, basically, it actually becomes more, un uh, more unfair than first come, first serve. And the paper has an all analysis of this. STFM, stall type frame memory scheduling, it's actually not bad. It's the best previous scheduler in terms of unfairness, as you can see. Even though its slowdown estimates are not correct, its relative estimates are correct. And uh, parallelism over batch scheduling actually reduces unfairness significantly, at least in these workloads that we examine. But this is also a workload dependent. There might be very cases where you don't gain a lot of benefit. You mean system, per system throughput, system performance? Memory. Yeah, memory throughput reduces uh, certainly in, uh, in these cases, but it's not, in, uh, it's not in these slides. But system throughput, in terms of weighted speed up or harmonic mean speed up, uh, uh, in terms of how much progress you're making in the cores, uh, that increases. As you can see, first ready, first come, first serve is normalized uh, to one. And then uh, first come, first serve is actually sometimes better, sometimes worse if you increase the number of cores. These are actually relatively bandwidth limited cases. Uh, and network fair queuing actually is better. Stall time fair memory scheduling is better. And also uh, CARBS is better than the best previous scheduler. Uh, although we're going to look at other schedulers later on. Uh, uh, so the performance benefits are coming from partially from parallelism awareness and partially from uh, the fact that we're reducing uh, unfairness in the system also because you're actually making better progress in the course. And it's very hard to really attribute where exactly the performance benefits are coming from. It's really a combination of both. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, so this, this provides a substrate for building other uh, memory scheduling mechanisms which you might be actually imagining in your head right now. So what are the upsides of this? It's basically the first scheduler to address bank parallelism destruction across multiple threads. It's a simple mechanism, especially versus STFM, but it's not simple enough. We're going to, we're going to try to be more simple uh, going forward, but we might become more complex before we become more simple. Uh, batching provides fairness, and it's a good substrate. It's actually employed uh, in, in several SOCs that I know of uh, with some sort of parallelism awareness combined to it. Uh, and ranking enables parallelism awareness. This is also employed to some extent in some SOCs. Uh, so the downside is this, basically. It doesn't always prioritize the latent sensitive application. Now, we realize that if, if it's, it's actually discussed in the paper also. Batching is not always a good idea if you have an application that's not very intensive, right? What's happening is you form a batch. This, applic this poor application has one request. Okay, its request gets serviced, it gets prioritized because of the ranking scheme, and then it generates another request, but then it needs to wait behind the batch now. That's the problem. So elephants are still killing the mice across the batches. And the paper tries to solve that problem. It's not an easy problem to solve if you want to stick to the principle of batching. So we're going to try to solve this problem in some of the next schedulers. When I say latency sensitive, it's also memory not intensive. So even, even though you may actually be equal priority, you may not have quality of service requirements. If you're not memory intensive like this mouse, you get deprioritized across the batches. Right? Because you may be unlucky, right? And that's, uh, this is actually the Achilles heel of uh, strict batching based mechanisms like this. Uh, and we're going to talk about some solutions.
like over time you move the batch. Yeah. Uh, as long as you provide starvation freedom, maybe. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there's no. <laughs> yeah, you need to treat these applications differently, basically. That's the realization that we're going to get to. So basically, if you have mice and elephant, there is no reason you should have a single scheduling policy that deals with all. These applications are different fundamentally. So you should really have a heterogeneous scheduling policy to handle them. That's the next realization or next, next realization. OK. So this paper is assigned, so take a look at it. I hope you'll enjoy it. It's a very dense paper because we didn't even put many of the policies that we examined uh, inside the paper. That's why I like some of the uh, more scientific conferences like Sigmetrics. They basically allow, as opposed to International Symposium on Cache Architecture, <laughs> they, they allow you to actually explore more and write uh, like 50 pages that where a paper is basically as long as it needs to be as opposed to as long as it's dictated to be. Okay. So uh, I'll very quickly talk about this uh, uh, Atlas memory scheduler idea. Uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is very, very interesting also, actually. Once we realized this downside, we basically wanted to look at other methods of scheduling. Uh, and uh, the idea here is uh, to maximize system performance. Now, we, we said, OK, uh, maybe we, we first explore something that tries to maximize system performance. And how do we do that? And the main idea is this, basically. Prioritize the thread that has attained the least service from the memory controllers. We call this adaptive per thread least attained service scheduling. Uh, now, why, uh, this naturally prioritizes these mice applications. Basically, these, if they get delayed, they attain very little service. As a result, uh, they become prioritized naturally. Whereas these elephants, when they, when they get serviced, they get a lot of service. So their attained service count increases meaning how, much, how many requests they get serviced increases. As a result, they naturally uh, get deprioritized over time. And that's the idea. Uh, basically, we rank threads based on how much service they have attained in the past time intervals. And there is some uh, accounting that happens in terms of uh, going into the past. And you enforce the thread ranking in the memory schedule during the current interval. So why does it work? Because it prioritizes these light memory non-intensive threads that are more likely to keep their cores busy. So this, mo uh, this mouse is more likely to, once its request gets serviced, it goes back to its core and keeps uh, do making progress. So if you look at this mouse, uh, it's basically stall time. But it's a lot of computation. And then it generates another memory request. If you look at this uh, elephant, it's ST is stall time. And it's very little computation. So it's going to stall again very soon. So if you actually are taking into account how much service each thread has obtained, this has obtained, let's say, I don't know, one amount of service, whereas this has obtained 100 amount of service. So whenever this gets a request, it's ranked higher. As a result, it can get its request serviced, and it can keep its core busy for a very long time. As a result, the core utilization on average increases. And core utilization on average correlates very strongly with system performance, overall system performance, because the core is making progress. And that's the idea. Now, if I would do it again, I would do it in a different way, but uh, let's not get into that. Basically, this is trying to minimize the, the stall times. If you actually flip the problem around, you really want to maximize the computation times. So actually, maybe there is another way of looking at memory scheduling, but uh, we're not going to look at it right now. When you talk about this, do you do the same thing as uh, you try to get to prioritize the memory request, but the more of the heavier memory? <laughs> It's very similar, but anyway, let's not get into the, <laughs> uh, the, the memory controller doesn't have the full picture. That's the downside, I think. <laughs> OK, so let's take a look at the results of this very quickly. So basically, we are looking at system throughput with a 24-core system. It's a weighted speed up in this case. And this is the number of memory controllers that you have. And this is 24 cores still. And uh, Atlas consistently provides higher throughput. As you can see, with four memory controllers, you get 8.4% throughput over PARBS, which is the best previous scheduler, according to these results. There are multiple things to look over here. If you're, if you're extremely bandwidth bound, your scheduling becomes much more important. You get higher performance over here, uh, delta. But of course, your performance also reduces. This, uh, this, is, uh, this is weighted speed up, so this is absolute. So your absolute performance is lower, as you can see, as you have n a smaller number of memory controllers. If you have a very high number of memory controllers, your absolute performance is very high. But scheduling matters less, as you can see. 
the delta between different schedulers is almost non-existent, right? Atlas still buys you 3.5%, but there's not that much difference between different schedulers. So scheduling matters when you when you're actually have, uh, when you actually either, uh, when, you're, uh, when you have some, th uh, have some things to play around with. Here, you're, bandwidth, you're very much bandwidth bottlenecked. Here, uh, well, here you're very much bandwidth bottlenecked. Here you have too much bandwidth, basically. And scheduling matters in somewhere in between. Yes? Yeah, so there is a mapping scheme, basically. So who's charging, who's charging if you're, uh, you know, like, uh, more, more embarrassing to acquire a lot of data? Mm -hmm. You could, yes. Not a lot of data. Mm -hmm. you, so the first one, you know, if, so if every time... No, they didn't change the applications here. This is basically applications are 24 applications, and you change the memory controllers. That's right. You could actually increase uh, more applications. No, 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 no. no, no. Because, you know, what I'm saying is it looks like you did use, you know, quite a lot of applications. Mm -hmm. most, most, there was not a lot of data, data dependent. Mm -hmm. No, this is all multi-programmed workloads. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. So every time you multiply a number of controllers, you really get big jump in, in performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the, the prefetchers are st uh, still employed here. Uh, this is just uh, this is just to uh, vary uh, the memory controller, right? This is look at the sensitivity. That's what we would like to do over here. Yeah, but, but, but usually in a computation you want to, 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 to adjust some of the mechanism that mm -hmm. you exercise the, the bandwidth mm -hmm. with respect to the load that you have in your own controller hardware. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So Yeah, I agree, but the goal here is not to design a system, right? It's, it's to show the sensitivity of the algorithm to the number of memory controllers. Uh, but I agree with you. If you were designing a system with 20, 16 memory controllers and 24 cores, you would make different design choices. Sure. Okay. Yes? No. So there is no batching in Atlas. <laughs> yeah. Basically, uh, we said that we want system throughput, and batching actually goes against system throughput. But, uh, if, you want, if you really want... Highest, actually, Atlas is very unfair. The paper looks at that and basically says uh, these threads that are uh, that basically do not attain, attain a lot of service get unfairly treated over time, which is as, as it's expected, right? It's not trying to be fair. Okay, so uh, this is the system throughput. So you can see that system throughput with the number of cores. Here, the memory controllers are fixed. You have four memory controllers, and you increase the number of cores. Uh, and you gain higher system throughput uh, compared to PARBS, as you can see. Okay, the paper has more detail, but I'm not, going to co I'm not covering a lot of uh, this. But the key, what are the key insights? Basically, Atlas is good at improving overall throughput. It's actually uh, perhaps one of the best schedulers in terms of overall throughput, if you don't care about fairness. Low complexity. Actually, this complexity is one of the lowest uh, of what we've discussed so far. You just need a least attained service uh, cycle counter depends on how you actually want to account for it. You, you can do it in terms of requests, in terms of cycles uh, per thread. And you need to somehow adjust it over time. And you need to do the ranking. Ranking is the hardest part, actually. We're going to get back to the ranking. We want to get rid of ranking later on. Uh, and coordination among controllers actually happens infrequently because we actually look at this ranking across very long time intervals. And you can read the paper for more. Yeah, the downside is, as I said, these lowest or medium rank threads get delayed significantly. You get high unfairness. And if you're interested in that, you can leave. Actually, the, there is a lot of theory behind Atlas. Uh, uh, you want to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the theory right now. So there's, uh, you, can, you can see the theory over here. OK, so after that, as I said, we realized you have these different sorts of threads. Uh, then the key question we asked was, why are we treating these threads in, in a similar way, especially if you want to get fairness and performance at the same time? So if you look at uh, scheduling algorithms that we've discussed, uh, we want to maximize system throughput, and we want to uh, maximize fairness. And I'm going to change the definition of fairness a little bit. Over time, we also realize there is a better definition of fairness, and I believe this is a better definition of fairness. Max versus min fairness, max slowdown divided by min slowdown. And you could argue with all of this, uh, because there is no uh, ground truth for fairness, right? 
uh, basically, uh, max versus min slowdown is really trying to equalize the slowdown of everyone. And the question is, is that a good thing to do? Assuming you have some performance substrate to begin with, why not keep maximum slowdown minimized? So basically, this uh, metric says there is a maximum slowdown that any thread has in the system, and we'd like to minimize it as much as possible. We don't care about the max divided by min. We'd like to minimize the maximum slowdown. I think this has some performance notion in it, and there are also other papers that are written recently that says, OK, this is a good idea. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. Because you could always argue uh, and find holes with fa fairness metrics. So ideally, you would like to be here, basically. You'd like to have better system throughput, and you'd like to have uh, highest uh, uh, fairness. So let's take a look at how different uh, algorithms that we've discussed so far behave. Atlas clearly has a system throughput bias. RBS is good at system throughput, but has a fairness bias slightly because of the batching mechanism. Stall time fair memory scheduling is actually not pretty optimal, as you can see. It is, it is superseded. First ready, first come, first serve is actually over here. It's very unfair, as you can see. And this is first come, first serve. So it sits over here. Of course, this is very workload dependent, and we're using about 96 workloads here. If you use different workloads, this picture may change. Uh, but basically, the key realization is that no scheduling algorithm is close to the ideal. Th these are both pretty optimal, actually, if you consider two metrics over here, PARBS and ATLAS. We wanted to basically break that trade-off and provide the best fairness and throughput at the same time. I'm going to desi uh, basically design a more complicated memory scheduling algorithm to achieve both. And it's going to be heterogeneous, basically. If you think about throughput versus fairness, I mean, this is, very, this is classic, actually. It happens in any kind of scheduling. Uh, you have a throughput-biased approach, and you have a fairness-biased approach. Throughput-biased approach, the realization is that ideally you would like to prioritize less memory-intensive threads. Basically, prioritize these mice and rank the threads uh, that have less memory intensity higher. This is good for throughput. This is bad for fairness uh, because the elephants now actually starve. You may think elephants don't starve, but they actually starve. <laughs> if you have too many mice, then the elephants don't, care, share, don't get their share, right? Actually, maybe, maybe the elephants don't care that much, but some, some things that are in the middle starve a lot. OK, so the fairness biased approach uh, at its extreme is basically take turns accessing memory. Uh, you basically, uh, in this case, the elephant doesn't starve. But by the time the turn comes to the, one, of the mouse, uh, one of the mice, it's too late. Because the mice now are now, now not prioritized. You get reduced throughput. So basically, single policy for all threads is insufficient. That's the key realization. So what do you do? How do you try to achieve the best of both worlds? And whenever, you're trying to, whenever you have something like this, Again, the key realization is that you should take a look at heterogeneity. And you want a heterogeneous scheduling policy. So for throughput, we would like to prioritize these mice, the memory non-intensive threads. And the hope is that there are not that many of them. Uh, so we'd like to ensure that there are not that many of them, such that they don't kill the performance of the uh, elephants. For fairness, the biggest unfairness is really caused by uh, some of the elephants some of the small elephants being prioritized by some of, uh, over some of the large elephants. Or even if they are equal, if you have a ranking across them, and if you always prioritize this one over this one over this one over this one, this last one gets slowed down a lot. So basically, we would like to be more fair across those, meaning shuffle the thread ranking across them. And these threads may be different. As a result, they have different vulnerability to interference. So adjust the shuffling in an asymmetric manner such that they still get good uh, service. So that's the idea, basically. So how do you achieve this? Uh, we're going to group the threads into two clusters. You look at all the threads in the system or hardware context that have generated requests. Some of them are memory non-intensive. Some of them are memory intensive. And you create a non-intensive cluster, an intensive cluster. And we prioritize a non-intensive cluster. I'm going to talk about how to create that uh, so that you get high throughput. Because these are going to keep their cores busy, like this, these mice. In each cluster, you have different policies. In this cluster, actually, policy doesn't matter that much as long as you're doing the clustering very well. But usually, your clustering is not perfect. As a result, there are some threads that are really small. There are some threads that are somewhat large. So we prioritize, uh, we rank the threads that are smaller over the larger ones over here. Here, you've got to be very, very careful if you want to 
uh, be fair and also high performance, you want to really shuffle the thread ranking as I discussed earlier. You don't want one thread to be prioritized for a long time over the other ones. So we're going to talk about uh, how this works. So clustering is an important part. Uh, basically, we sort the thread based on misses per thousand instruction. In, basically, that's the intensity of the thread, memory intensity of the thread. How many memory accesses they're having per, per thousand instructions. And they all uh, have some memory bandwidth usage. Let's call that T. And we're going to allocate uh, those threads that consume a fraction of that memory bandwidth usage into the non-intensive cluster. I think in this case, our cluster threshold was 10%. So out of all the threads that are consuming memory bandwidth, the threads that are consuming only 10% of the memory bandwidth are uh, clustered to be in this non-intensive cluster. After you sort them, of course. These are the lightest threads, basically. That makes sense. Of course, you could come up with many, many clustering algorithms, which we're not going to get into right now. You calculate it. Yeah, you calculate in the previous interval, and then you expect things are not going to change that much, so you're going to use that in the next interval. So that's the idea for clustering. And the rest goes into the intensive cluster. Now you can easily ask the question, why have two clusters? Why not have three, four, five? Yes, but that increases the complexity. It's already a complex algorithm, by the way. I think it's not easy to implement. Okay, so the, uh, what do you do between clusters? You between, between clusters, you prioritize the non-intensive cluster. As I said, non-intensive threads have greater potential for making progress, keeping their cores busy. So this is good for throughput. And hopefully, if you've done the clustering right, this doesn't degrade fairness, because this consumes only a very small fraction of the memory bandwidth. If this were consuming a huge fraction of the memory bandwidth, then this is not true. Okay. Uh, so within non-intensive cluster, as I said, uh, there are some, there's still heterogeneity between the threads. So we rank the threads with the uh, lowest MPKI uh, in a rank order uh, over threads with the higher MPKIs. Least intensive thread still has the greatest potential for making progress in the processor. That's the idea. In the intensive cluster, things get more hairy, as I said. You periodically shuffle the priority of the threads. You basically, you form a ranking and you shuffle that ranking. You don't want to do it uh, on a per request basis. You want to do it on a, a, a number of request basis so that each thread can actually uh, exploit robot for locality uh, and bank level parallelism. And that increases fairness. So the key question is, is treating all threads equally good enough? It turns out that's not true, so you actually have bias uh, in the ranking because equal turns doesn't mean that you have the same slowdown. So let's take a look at that, actually. Uh, basically, let's take a look at two intensive threads contending with each other. One is random access, one is streaming. Uh, which one is slowed down more easily? <laughs> so if you actually prioritize a random access thread, streaming thread slows down by a lot. But if you prioritize a streaming thread, random access th thread slows down a lot more because streaming thread actually hits uh, a particular bank for a long time because it's really streaming through that bank. As a result, it disturbs that random access thread much more. Let's take a look at why that's the case. Uh, so this is, again, pictorial. Let's say you have memory with four banks. These are the rows. Random access thread distributes its requests, assuming they are similarly intensive. Random access thread distributes its requests to uh, different banks by nature of random access. And you have very good bank double parallelism, as you can see, with random access. Yeah, I already said that. Streaming thread, in contrast, sends requests to the same bank because it's really streaming through the row buffer. And this is what happens. It has very good row buffer locality. All requests go to the same row. Now, if both requests, both threads are executed at the same time, this is what happens. If you prioritize a streaming thread over the random access thread, random access thread request gets stuck behind this. As a result, its bank double parallelism is destroyed. That's why you see a much higher slowdown on the random access thread. Whereas if you prioritize this green one over the red one, streaming slowdown would be less. Hence the result that I showed you earlier. Streaming thread slows down much less uh, compared to the random access thread if the other thread is prioritized. Okay, so this is more vulnerable to interference. That's assuming everything else is equal, meaning they, they have equal memory intensity. Uh, this random access thread is more vulnerable to interference whereas the streaming thread is less vulnerable to interference. And we use that insight to form a ranking that takes into account bank level parallelism and robot for locality. It's a more complicated ranking mechanism that I'm not going to go into over here. Well, I guess I will go into it very quickly. Yes?
Similar, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, I uh, I say four over here, but it could be much much longer, right? Yeah, it could be like tw sixty-four, let's say. I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm actually imagining a much higher number. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you think about, let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, 16 banks, uh, then you'll have 16 requests in the ideal case for the random access and 16 requests for the streaming one. And uh, that those 16 requests are probably going to might take much longer. Yes. I think... <laughs> Yeah, I think the number goes higher. Uh, this is just one thread, right? But if you have more threads, now you have more streaming ones and more random access ones. That's how the numbers become higher. That's how I am envisioning. These two threads, two threads are always example to motivate. But if you have more threads, they essentially act like more streaming threads and more random access threads. Yeah, I mean, this is all motivation. Uh, so the, the real world, I understand, is not as uh, nice as this motivation. <laughs> OK, so basically, how do you quantify the difference between threads? Basically, you have some niceness. And basically, we associate a value of niceness to the thread. If a thread has higher bank level parallelism, it's more vulnerable to interference. If a thread has a high robot for locality, it's more likely to cause interference. And we compute the niceness value that you can read on paper. And uh, we basically shuffle uh, the thread ranking based on this niceness value. Nice threads are more likely to appear at the top than the not nice threads uh, in terms of the ranking. That's the idea. But this is a more complicated part of the algorithm, and this buys you a, a questionable amount in terms of how much benefit it gains you. Okay, so this operates based on quantum. So you have a previous quantum and a current quantum. In the previous quantum, uh, you basically look at the thread behavior, memory intensity, bank level parallelism, and robot for locality. And beginning of the quantum, you perform the quant clustering, and you compute the niceness of intensive threads. And you essentially uh, apply the algorithm uh, based on the clusters and uh, the niceness of the threads. And this is the shuffling interval that we have in terms of uh, how, how much you shuffle the ranking. And this is the resulting scheduling algorithm. It's again a priority order. Uh, highest rank means requests from higher rank threads are prioritized. And this depends on which cluster you're in. Non-intensive clusters prioritize over intensive cluster. Uh, within the non-intensive cluster, lower intensity is prioritized uh, over others. And within the intensive cluster, we have this rank shuffling that changes every 1,000 cycles or so. And uh, everything else being equal over here, row hit requests are prioritized over others. And everything else being equal, all the requests are prioritized over others. And so you can read the paper. I think more than the storage cost, the complexity of the algorithm is actually uh, relatively high in this case. Uh, and we actually have an implementation of it that shows that its complexity as it's, it's not easy, uh, as easy to implement. Even PARBS is easier to implement compared to this, actually. OK, so we've already covered some of these things, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But uh, FRCFS uh, is low throughput, low fairness. STFM, by this point in time, is low throughput now. PARBS is also low throughput by this point in time. ATLAS is low fairness. So we're going to compare the, to these. And remember, we wanted to uh, actually break this trade-off, right, uh, ATLAS and PARBS. Where does TCM get you? TCM actually gets you over here. Now, the downside is very workload dependent. Uh, so if you actually uh, take some other set of 100 workloads and you want to optimize it, you need to do a lot of tuning to ensure that uh, this works nicely. So sometimes it gets you over here, maybe. Sometimes it gets you over here. Sometimes it gets you somewhere over here if you don't optimize it carefully. So one of the downsides of TCM is it, it needs to be very carefully tuned. Right? OK. So one of the other things that's important in a scheduling algorithm, I think, is how do you actually change uh, uh, the configuration parameters? And there could be many configuration parameters. We pick the uh, most interesting configuration parameters, at least. For example, in STFM, the configuration parameter was the alpha, right? Uh, the unfairness uh, threshold. And if you change that, you basically move 
from uh, one, uh, one fairness value to some other fairness value without significantly changing your throughput as you can see over here, if you change that within reasonable values. FRFCFS's uh, tuning parameter is, remember I introduced something like FRFCFS cap, how many requests, uh, if you want to reorder uh, 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 requests, how many requests can be reordered uh, over the oldest request? And that's a cap. If you change that parameter, you get a curve like this, in these workloads at least. So it's not a very easy to reason about curve. This is very unfair as you can see. This is more fair, but also lower throughput, and this is somewhat better. So this is the Pareto optimal part of FRFCFS actually. So you cannot easily reason about the parameter. PARBS has this marking cap parameter. It determines your batch size as you can see. It, improve, it affects your fairness a bit. It doesn't affect your throughput that much, in these workloads at least. Atlas has... Uh, this interval uh, that you decide how big of, are, are your intervals. So that affects your throughput a lot. It doesn't affect your fairness that much. In TCM, this cl cluster threshold that we have, at least in these workloads, buys you a not so bad throughput fairness tra uh, trade off. So all of these points that I plot over here are actually Pareto optimal. Uh, so if you might be, we might want to operate over here to minimize slowdown, uh, minimize, uh, maximize fairness, but that gets you lower performance. And if you operate here, you increase your uh, unfairness, but that gets you higher throughput. Okay. It's not always this nice. Again, if you tune your algorithm, then it's, it turns out this, uh, it works. But if you don't tune it, then it's not that great. Okay, so basically it's a tunable knob. OS can now trade off between fairness and throughput, depending on whether it can know the goals. And you could also enforce thread weights. This is something that I didn't really discuss in any of the other algorithms, but you actually have mechanisms to enforce thread weights in different algorithms. For example, the OS can assign weights to the threads, and those get com uh, conveyed uh, to the memory controller. And TCM, in this case, enforces the weights within each cluster. We had something like that for parallelism over batch scheduling also that I didn't discuss. Uh, there was something like that for stall time fair memory scheduling. You, you could convey the priorities of the threads, basically. And uh, if you look at the stall time fair memory scheduling algorithm, if a thread has high priority, the algorithm would naturally uh, multiply that priority with the slowdown it experiences. And if you have a high priority, the thread would appear to have very high slowdown to begin with, so it would get naturally prioritized. So you could easily convey uh, this information from the operating system to the memory controller. Today, this is not done as far as I know, uh, but I think it's a good idea to do. So that's the conclusion uh, for TCM, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, basically. We, want to, uh, we looked at all these scheduling algorithms and I think the realization at the end was you want something that's heterogeneous to handle the demands of very different threads. We couldn't handle it in some other way, but we're going to get back to some other things uh, later on to simplify the approach. Uh, and you don't want to use a single policy for all threads. So we want to use multiple different policies, in this case two, by grouping the threads into clusters. And as I said, prioritizing non-intensive threads is good for throughput. Shuffling priorities in the intensive cluster is good for fairness, and you want to be careful in how you shuffle. Basically, threads have very different values of niceness to each other. And that's the conclusion at this time. So let me cover the upsides and downsides of this. So it turns out if you tune the parameters, this is good for both high fairness and high performance. It caters to the needs for different types of threads, latency versus bandwidth sensitive. Actually, even if you don't do this automatically, if you have these two different clusters, Maybe somebody else can do the clustering, right? If the software is able to do that clustering much better and leave it to the memory controller, this clustering may be a good idea. And there's more to, to explore in this area, in my opinion. We were doing everything automatically in hardware, right? It's relatively simple, <laughs> although take that with a grain of salt. I think it's conceptually simple. Implementation is not uh, very easy, especially if you want very large buffer sizes. And the robustness becomes a problem, actually, uh, when you're clustering and shuffling. And ranking is actually pretty complex, I think, especially this sort of ranking that TCM does. So this is probably a good place to stop if there are no questions, no burning questions. So let's take a break for uh, until 12 minutes, and I'm going to deconstruct everything I've said about ranking in a little bit. It's always good to question things 